Where are all my friends? James Kirkham. It is a long time coming. Yep. And I have to tell you why. Because you don't like me. I sometimes do this podcast and it's people that I just meet and it's really exciting. I love it. And I make new friends and I learn all about their stories. And that's really special to me. But then there's the other side of it where I do this podcast with people that are really, really near and dear to my heart. And I think that that's the most special because as much of your story as I know, you learn a little bit differently when you sit down and do a podcast because there's certain questions that I just never would ask. And it also like, takes this process to learn. Yes. For me. Yes. You know, like the thing is, is we just don't reflect. We don't stop. Yes. Yeah. We don't stop. We've been on the chip. You <laughs> taught me that yeah, saying. I've been on the chip a lot. That's the top. That's the top of the limits of a car. Thing. Rev limiter. Yes. It's just really, really special to me. And I wanted to make sure it was the right yeah. time. And well, thank you. I feel thank, like it's, it's thank you for um, assuring me that you like me as yeah. a human being. I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, uh, I know, but for real, I, we, I, it's been a joking point for, for some time now because I keep seeing all these snippets of your podcast of all these amazing people that come through our circle. And, <laughs> and Jacob like, and I always give you shit of, <laughs> when are we on? But and it's that, funny because... I, I'm super honored to be here. Uh, there's not many people in the world that are as genuine as you are it's special to have your perspective on the world and um thank you for sharing that with us all and i'm grateful uh, to and honored to be here talking with you well you're one of those people that i think has an equally beautiful perspective and i think that you have a perspective that's extremely unique because of your story and because of how you got there mm. that's why i'm so excited about this one and like just for a listener like before we get into like your specific story to share why this is so special to me i've had different eras and chapters in my life and i'm very happy with my life i've definitely experienced some lows but didn't we meet on many of those yeah see there's the universe right I was think, it really a low well actually a high well, no, low or high, I would have met you there, but I think that it takes the low to get high. Yeah. And like, so, so on my <laughs> side, on my side, I had come from like the music world and I really loved that. From 18 years old to like 25, I was touring with my best friends and it was my favorite moments of my whole life. And it was very fulfilling. I was working with my best friends every day. The, the struggle didn't matter because we were so fulfilled. Ultimately, like I never thought the day would come, but I just like, kind of the band wanted to go in a different direction like creatively that i didn't agree with and i kind of grew where i wanted to try to grow businesses and more than just one thing so i ultimately left and started working at record labels it was the that it re <laughs> well i don't I, even think I it was just, that it was and it's crazy you worked at labels too that's a whole other part of your life mm -hmm. but it wasn't until then that I realized that not everybody in your life is remarkably special. And mm -hmm. that feeling of fulfillment and working with your best friends and doing something you love every day is something that not everybody gets to do. Mm -hmm. So I, it wasn't until I was like 25 years old that I was like, is this what being depressed feels like? Mm -hmm. like I was like, oh no. I feel that every 25 days. That was cool. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> but like, dude, it was just this weird feeling where then from like 25 to, I don't know, call it like uh, 29, 30, like a good chunk of years that I ended up going from like labels to trying to manage to then like doing the corporate life. And I was just fucking lost. Mm. And like, I made a little bit of money and whatever, but Man, like I'm at so time, grateful to be found. Dude, dude, seriously, that I'm so grateful for that. It took a long time to get there. Actually, it just took a deliberate choice for you. Yeah. Or, it yeah. just takes, del it takes intention. Yes. But it takes a while to get to that point of intention. But well, once and, you have intention, then you're like, oh, I found. But you showed it. Me, you It happened to me again because of you. Yeah, thank and you. it's this crazy, like you just need to understand this and the listener needs to understand this because it sets the stage for why this is so yeah. important. I moved to LA and chased the record label dream and basically find out once I'm here, I'm like, oh, this isn't the dream. And I then did that I, too in my life. Yeah. I, I got lost and like I was doing the corporate thing, but then I was out in California and I was basically like, I'm here for no reason. Like I'm from Florida. All my friends are back there. Like if I didn't like the record label thing, what am I doing? To say it short, like I always liked music and loved cars, but I never knew you could work in cars. And then on the weekends and like while I was like kind of dirtling around wondering what the purpose of life was and missing the days of being fulfilled, I would just go to like car meets and stuff on the weekends. And I always loved cars. Mm. And I, I was starting to like kind of embrace the California, like I was finding cool people and friends and cars. I didn't have as many friends out here. And I randomly meet you at some uh, car meet down in OC at period correct, which was funny enough, rare for both of us to mm -hmm. be there. But there was just something about you. You had a Mercedes GTR and you did a, I'd always say the name wrong. Is it Vemont or Vetements? Vemont. It's Vemont. Yeah. 
you had that on the side of the car and I was like, oh, that's cool. Like that's a clothing brand, right? And you're like, yeah, well, it's kind of this joke. Like they steal all these logos, whatever. But my impression and what that meant to me was the coolest person at this meet with the most style and the best build who no one was really talking to because I think everybody thought you were a famous or like too approachable or too intimidating was the nicest person to me there. Mm. And all I did was like say a thing. And then like we got into this great conversation. And that was it. I was just that I walked away from that and I was like, that dude was cool as fuck. And then I randomly meet you again at, I think, an FD with my friend Gino. In the parking lot. Yeah. One time you're like, oh, like we just started this thing called race service. Like we're doing this event. Come through. And I was going to events and all that. I came there in like, dude, it had to have been like a couple months after. It was the Rotoform right. party. Yeah. When was, was that? Yeah. yeah. That was months after RS yeah. opened? Yeah. I come in there. That's the thing you and your friends always dream about. Like that was the thing. I didn't know it was possible. I was like, in my head, I was like, I have to get rich. I thought I was going to be a race car driver. That was what I thought I was going to do as a kid. Mm. But I was like, oh, that's not a real career. You have to like go be a doctor, go get rich somewhere, and then you can do it. It's and true. the idea around that of like, I also want to have this great space where I could build cars with all my friends, whatever. And I walk into it and you made it. Yeah. And I'm like, this fucking guy did this? And ever since that moment, no, it was like, this is what I want to do. Like, this is it again. It was the feeling of the band. And that's so cool, by the way. It's it's definitely like a, such a collective effort. And we created something really special. And I've, we've had like leaders from all industries come through. And every time it's like, fuck, this is it. All these really yes. am amazing people, the successful people, athletes, musicians. Culture. Constantly. People, everyone. Every time. What is this? Why is it so special? It's the people. It's community. It's 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 living with a full heart. But who who laid that foundation? We did. You, Jacob, and a handful of the OGs that had that vision. It took a long time to get there. But that long time and the groundwork for my favorite thing in the world, race service. A lot of that was laid by you. I don't want to give you know like obviously there's a lot of people that made RS happen, right? So I don't want to be like James Cochran did it all. But, but, but I'm a dreamer. Yes. I push people. And, and it's you because I, I, I believe we are super limiting in our human experience. And it's taken a long time to get there. But yeah. I know that we create our own existence and that we create our own ceilings. Yeah. And that with the belief of ourselves, if, with, we, we, we can achieve anything. Listeners, let me tell you one quick thing. Everything is perfect. Everything always works out and nothing actually matters. Because it is, you know what, like the perfect in the sense of like, you're going to, you're going to go through shit, yeah. but it'll give you what you need on the end. Yeah. It's, it gives you the ability to be there and especially it, with the right perspective, because if you play the victim, it's, it's a miserable existence. But that's, what's fascinating to me about your story. And that's what I kind of want to get into is like, you have this beautiful outlook. You're raising the brightest, raddest kids. You're empowering all these people around you your life to get there is so crazy. And I feel yeah. like there's so many lessons in that. One of the reasons why I am the way I am is because I'm super fucking hard on myself. And it causes a lot of pain. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, the only reason- I don't see that side of oh, you. Oh, I'm never satisfied with myself. And and there's, there's, there's a hole there that I'm trying to work on spiritually, obviously. And that's why successful people are successful because they're never good enough. For themselves that, it's hard that makes me respect you more because it's like that i guess again it's like what i see in myself it's like a lot of people are like oh yeah super positive guy i'm like that doesn't mean that i'm not oh super no i feel that and when i was that. when i was gassing you up earlier and saying you're so positive and all that i know that there's the equal amount of pain that goes yeah, with that because yeah. it, it's one our protection for ourselves but it's also how we live and, and how we approach life but life is hard mm -hmm. life is really hard and we're only human yeah. And we need to be easier on ourselves. We're never taught to love ourselves. Yeah. We're never, ever, ever, ever taught. We're shunned right. to think, love yourself. That makes you feel selfish to say, right? Yeah. Love myself. Oh, I'm selfish. What right. the fuck? Yeah. The only thing, if I could teach my child one thing, mm. love yourself. That's it. Respect yourself. Love yourself. You're only human. This but is all you, made up. You're only human. Do you this think is a that weird that's a reflection existence. of yourself, though, saying that you're so hard on yourself is like that the thing that you wish that you could change the most. So you then try to empower yeah. Ren and no, that's different. Okay. I mean, I'm hard on myself, but I already see it with them. They they have the same traits. Yeah. You know, Ren's so hard on herself. Really? She's so talented though. She's but it, it causes, you know, what do they say? Pressure creates diamonds, whatever. It sure does. But like it, it, yeah, for whatever reason as human beings, we're taught to like do this thing to like 
prove that we're worth. Yeah. That lack of telling yourself you're good enough yeah. that creates the the machine that's driven to succeed. Yeah. Like I thrive on tasks and succeeding at tasks. Yeah. Like I love I could do anything. Challenge yeah. me. I'll Dude, do I, anything, dog. I know. Like, I know. I've watched you frame a house. <laughs> <laughs> like, but that's the thing is like we're so limited by like the, what we're told we're supposed to be. And like early on, I I couldn't vibe with traditional school like you were blessed with not having a, a public school experience yeah, and i'm blessed but, with having a public school experience right, it's equally yeah. a thing whatever like yeah no like, tell me about that though because i'm curious like where that all comes from yeah i just didn't i was like this is whack like from like, like this middle is school not, I was, high school like where did you start to process like i'm not the same or like what i don't know real recognize real and you can just see fake quick yeah. And you're like, these teachers aren't even inspired. Oh, this whole fuck. system's fucked. Like, you know what oh, I mean? Like, even the yes. inspired, I, I, the inspired teachers, like, I remember like it was yesterday, like they're still, Jason Resch, what's up? Thank you for supporting me. He was like a 24 year old marketing teacher. Yeah, who, like, dude. Who like taught me about marketing and and was also a super big NASCAR fan. Yeah, and Richard now, Washburn. Yeah, he's, now he's he my biggest fan. We catch up every once in a while, but he's like a G. He's a yeah. marketing G. He taught me uh, so much in life, but like most of the other people are already consumed in the yeah. system and they're like checking the boxes. For some reason you had the radar early on. You're yeah. like, I can tell that like you're, teaching me but you got nothing to teach yeah like, and also i just was like wasn't engaged i just it didn't inspire me at all i, I had the very deliberate decision oh i can cheat to mm -hmm. get through this system mm -hmm. so easily mm -hmm. i don't even have to try yeah and i and what what's a passing grade or what's a passing grade that doesn't look bad mm -hmm. a 3.0 mm -hmm. like and yeah. how easy is that like i don't even have to try I can do it with my eyes closed and still graduate with a B. I found the loopholes early on yeah. and was like, I don't even have to try. I can win. Mm. And and I remember this very deliberate moment when I realized that. And I like was like, oh, this is so easy. I can game the whole system. It, it didn't take long for me to be like, that's not right. That's not how you're raised. You don't cheat. It just wasn't for me. I felt like it was easy. But that's crazy. I kind of feel like that still applies to you. I feel like low key, you know that it's easy and you can game the system. Like, to fast forward a little bit, like donut media days, mm. like viral video after viral video after viral video. It's not like you sat here and like overthought it. You were just like, this is going to work. Yeah. Like there's been these moments that I've seen and know about your life where I'm like, mm. oh, fuck. Like if you're saying that you had that in high school, the way you figured out how to make money to pay for racing, like all these things, mm. like, is that not a theme? Yeah. I don't know where it came from, to be honest. Like my dad had it pretty rough. Like my dad went to Vietnam and like killed people like yeah you know, like he was a he gunner he was rough. a gunner in a huey in vietnam and like like he didn't talk about it kind uh -huh. of thing. like you didn't learn that until later my dad was a recovered alcoholic yeah. i never saw him drink a drink once in his life he drank a duels and yeah. wow my man my man sacrificed himself for his family he was given the opportunity to be there for his family and he was wow and he showed up that and dude he, went to work every day every day at like 2 p.m and I, I never saw him because he would drive trucks and he went to driving tanker gas trucks like for Texaco. But he just worked his ass off and did it with intention, did it with purpose. He had his 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 shirt would be ironed perfectly every day when he left the, sh the house. He did it with pride. He was yeah. the leader of his team. If a job's worth doing, it's worth doing right. My dad did everything right. The one thing he actually did for himself was buy a Harley and it, it, and and it was what killed him. He took a second job delivering papers to pay for that Harley without telling us. You know, he, he told my mom, but he right. hid it from us. He was ashamed of that. So he was working two jobs to have a Harley Davidson and then died on it. You know, every Kirkham in my family has died in a motor vehicle accident, every male Kirkham. And I race cars, you know, like we repeat our pasts and our parents. But you know, what's interesting is you're repeating his positives. I know. Like, I wonder if you can rewrite history a little yeah, bit. Yeah, and I'm not going to die in a car. Die. I'm not going to die in a car. I might. I'm okay but with that. And I when know I'm you would When it's time be, to go, it's time to go. I, I genuinely know you would I, But like, please don't. No, I don't want to. I don't want to. But, I, don't, I, I mean, I look at my kids and like, I know the pain it caused me. Yeah. Like, granted, I have the ability to look back and think that that was the most beneficial thing that's ever happened in my life. That was the best day of my life. If you look at it in that perspective, yeah. my dad dying, it gave me a superpower to live righteous, to, to make my mom proud, to make my dad proud, to live for his legacy. I, I really believe that like everything happens the way it should, that everything's perfect. Nothing matters. And I guess that's only when you're living with intention and living, uh, you're true to yourself yeah. when you're doing what feels right. What yes. makes you happy? Yeah. When you deny what makes you happy, yes. and you do what you're supposed to do, which then I never it's... did. I never did that. That's I guess what makes me me. 
is I never did what I was supposed to do. Ever. I went against the grain the whole way. My, my that's mom. That's the theme. That's the theme. My teachers would all say that he's really smart, but he doesn't listen. I, Even I respected the choice people. of losing your dad and making that the best day of your life is going against the grain. Yeah. People I know. And it bothers people when I say that. that. Right. Yeah. I get this combination of like what your life was seeing that example of him, but then always being that smart kid that could challenge authority or to like do the thing you wanted to do. Like I'm really starting to see of like, aha, the James that that I know and love has been that person for a while. I don't know where that rebellious spirit came. I played baseball growing up and um, we were really good. Like a lot of my friends went to the major leagues. Yeah. But it taught me a lot. Like there's, it's made me who I am, but yeah, well, I was good. Like yeah. we had like home run records for, and I would use wood bats in little league. Like it, it was just this really, yeah. Visceral upbringing of being really good at something. Mm-hmm. But then at some point it like it, it, it became like less interesting. I remember sitting in the outfield at this really amazing field that we played at called Alpen Rails Dairy. And there was a go-kart track in the background. And I'd seen that those go-karts go around and be like, well, that looks way cooler than this. And that's where that first like moment of like going against the the grain of like, I don't, maybe I don't want to do this. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm good at it, but I want to do that. My dad used to take me to the racetrack. I'll back up a few years when I was growing up. I remember the moment that I fell in love with motorsports, like very visceral moment when I saw a helmet flash by as my dad was carrying me into this track. So I was like eight years old or younger, the colors of this helmet. And I, it's like burned into my brain. And I remember seeing the matching colors on a flag in the stands. And at that moment, it was, I'm willing to do anything to be doing something to give the amount of pride that those people feel. Like, yeah. I want to make people proud. Yeah. Like, I want, to, I'm willing to risk my life to make people proud. Yeah. And that still stands. Like, I'll die on the sword. Yeah. You know, Damn. I will die on the sword. But you, you translate that message very positively. Yeah. Like, you're not doing it as a stupid martyr that's like. No, no, no. But like, I, I'm willing to, to sacrifice for people. And that, I think yeah. that's the fulfillment in life is okay, like but- giving yourself to something. There's one moment leaving Please. the Portland auto show. My friend's dad, Stephen's dad, yeah. took me to the auto show with him in his E36 four-door silver. Oh. It was like his pride and joy. And I remember leaving Highway 26 in Portland, getting on to 217. He got on the gas. He's a pretty conservative dude. He got on the gas and went through like maybe one gear. Like, you know, he just like downshifted and, and went through one gear. Yeah, And it was like, I was in the back seat and I was like, after seeing all these cars and then feeling that feeling, I was like, oh, you can do that here on the street. Then that, that feeling of speed was burnt into me. It's just nuts because like not everybody is like you, like mm. you and I, like we both love cars and we both love racing, but like it's different. Yeah. Like, you know, like I'll tell you about my favorite specs of cars yeah. and you'll tell me about like the fastest you cars. can go like flat out yeah. through the turn and how you do it. Yeah. But like, this like I this is fast. to anyone out there who wants to go fast i want to go fast here's the part where and again it's this layer of like damn i respect you and damn your story has been crazy because you get that feeling but it's like okay cool but you didn't have that family that could just pay for a no. life of carting or whatever no so you had to go figure that out for yourself yeah like my dad took me bmx racing uh-huh. that was what taught me about racing to be oh. honest that we could afford that we built used to we, we used to ride bmx bikes like that, that was everything to us. It was our that freedom. So we, we, it was so Portland. We had forests. We lived in a little like planned community, suburban, lower middle class. And it was everything for my parents. You know, they 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 maxed everything out to have this life for us. So sick. And before that, we had lived in like really shitty rental houses. And yeah. I remember like God man. Yeah. Shouts yeah. to your parents. Yeah, like, shouts. Kim Chambers, Kim. legend. Um we love Kim. They did sacrifice for the family. Yeah. I remember wanting to to have more things and i got a job at subway i remember my first lunch rush i was like fuck this the lunch rush was like it was the most overwhelming thing ever and this guy in the middle of the lunch rush t- asked if i wanted to work at Laserport, which was like a laser, laser tag? tag arena and so i was like fuck yes like laser tag let's do yeah, that better. so i ended up going to work at laser tag after like a week at subway but there was something cool there that burnt into my brain about cars mike mike was two years older than me mike had a mark ii uh gti uh-huh. shaved handles white euro front grill slammed slammed and i was just like what is that i remember looking at it through like the tinted glass of laser port 
being like, what the fuck is, where'd your door handles go, man? And he does and the remember, Viper popper yeah, or whatever. Yes, yes. I was like, this guy's dope. He must have sex. <laughs> <laughs> He's the cool guy. You know He's what got mean? this figured Dude. out. What doesn't he know? Dude. And we had a pizza driver. A pizza delivery driver that had a slam civic white Let's that would, go. yeah and he would just it just got clapped more and more clapped out that guy's car never changed throughout our whole childhood that's amazing it was just bumper falling off he had a body kit on it you know yeah. it was the first car with a body kit we saw yeah like, what's that just watch it that looks cool yeah <laughs> that made me want that for yeah. myself yeah. And, and 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 those are the things that i chase mm -hmm. i was buying car parts mm -hmm. out of the back of a magazine mm -hmm. because it was that yeah. you, catalog order yeah, shit at the yeah, time yeah. i was 15 years old with a, car, a, a room full of car parts. I had a full, full big bumpers, like uh, Euro lights, grill, like the lip, the mm. Euro lip, you Just know, like hustling. Uh, springs. I had wheels, uh, uh, millimiglias. Like I, the day my grandma told me that she'd buy me a car, I had like 1500 bucks. We went to Clackamas, Oregon. My dad and I found this like 1991 Jetta GLI, Recaros and everything. Game and over. 1500 bucks had a sick car, drilled holes in the airbox. Slammed it, put all those parts on it. Within like a couple of days, it was sick. Of course, uh, Euro, that, Euro, that's how long it took you. Euro plates. Like I was working at the Nike employee store in the morning before school. And I'd go to school, like reduce schedule because I knew how to find the loopholes. And then I'd go to work at the Nike employee store after school. I, I had throughout variations of three jobs throughout all of growing up, including school. And I worked really hard to to have the things yeah and i used to just like drive by the high school football field just with my cool cars just to show people you know that's what we did like yeah, flex. yeah and that we started street racing oh okay. we started street yeah, racing yeah. and that was when it was like oh shit we looked cool as fuck mm -hmm. we had a crew we had and that was that was that's it cars are just a, like an extension of us as humans and it's it's community and, and it's relatability and it's okay. It's this primitive thing of like showing people that were like, you know, cool. That's like, that's around when you met Yair too, right? Yeah. That's yeah. So he, he, like, well, that OG was even race service squad goes far back, far back. Yeah. yeah. I quickly went from, from Jetta to Honda because mm -hmm. I realized how much faster Hondas were. Uh, Sorry. And Volkswagen. competitive and, and competitive. Yeah. yeah. And they were just sick. I mean, like I, I forget the first impression I had on a Honda, but VTech man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and we got deep in the car cruise, like, like, you know, at that point, I was after my dad died. My dad had died when I was 17. Wow. Yeah. And so it just rocked like a me. Crazy time of like. Yeah. No, yeah. I'll never forget that moment walking into your house and seeing your world on its head because my mom then had to tell me that my dad died. Everything just became different and nothing mattered anymore. And not in a bad way because at the same time, everything had so much more meaning. Yeah. Because I had this reason to live. Yeah. It was hard. I didn't relate with anybody anymore. Everybody wanted to be there for me. They didn't know how. I masked it with drugs. We'd smoked a lot of weed. Like we were selling drugs. We were stealing cars. We were stealing. We were do. We were just getting into trouble. Yeah. We were street racing. That dude, was our big so outlet. Like, how the fuck did you get out? Like, dude, that's like I everything pretty much, you just painted there. I'm like, that's life. Like that's that could go a very dark way. I've been tested time and time and time and time and time and time again. Yeah. But every time I get tested, I look in the mirror and I say, all right. It's time to show up again and you just do it again and you just show up. And maybe it's because I've seen people that don't have that resilience. I guess my question there is, does it get better? Like every time that you show up again, yeah. like, do you, does it get easier? Does it get better? Cause for me, from the outside looking in, knowing a bit of your I'll be life rocked and, again. I'll be rocked again. Mm. You know what I mean? But I'm, I'm on a pretty good high right now. Like and I know that that's fleeting to some extent, but actually my outlook on life is that every day gets better than the previous because the secret to life is growth. Mm. And if you carry that with you, then every day is better than the previous because you're growing mm. and, and you're learning and, and absorbing new things and seeing, taking the experiences you have and using that as a lens to, to shape the only thing that matters, which is now. It's not about tomorrow. It's not about yesterday. It's about now. Yeah. Right now, right now, right now. In this very moment that we're talking, this is all that matters. Nothing else. Everything else around us is a story that we've created. And when you when you understand that, yeah. and I, you know, like I like to think I understand, mm -hmm. then you have this invincibility. Everything else is perfect. It's perfect. Right now is what matters. And guess what? We as humans shape our whole experience on the stories that matter to nobody else. That that's invincibility. Because everybody else 
shapes their existence based on something that happened to them that nobody gives a fuck about. Right. It's something so far back. No so, one knows. Like literally cares. everything in your life you can yeah. trace back to a moment. I guarantee it. Everything in your life you can trace back to a moment yeah. that you shaped the way that you see the world. Yeah. Like specific, everything. like so, specific things you do, would, you could trace back to a specific moment. Mm. We carry these like weird things, and that's our own. That's that's being a human. Yeah. But when you realize that that story actually doesn't exist for anybody else. Yeah. My dad died, and it rocked my fucking world. Yeah. I didn't relate to any of my friends anymore, but yeah. I had this idea of success for myself in order to make my mom and dad proud. So then I like just was like, well, what do I do? I'm in Beaverton, Oregon. I don't like school. I don't want to go to university. I don't resonate with that. So I went to. And talking to the 20 year old person who doesn't know where the fuck they're doing with their life, nobody knows what they're doing in their life. And we never do. And that's when you accept that, then you have like another layer of invincibility. <laughs> yeah. But what you need to do is go for what you feel feel is true to you, like yeah. what makes you happy. Like that's a, You've had that's a, lot a simple of versions fact. Of that though, haven't you? What's that? You've had a lot of versions of yeah, that. Yeah, 100%. Haven't you? Because I didn't necessarily know. Interesting. And, and, and I thought I did. And yeah. so, well, I didn't know how to get there. I got enrolled in FITM, went to FITM, Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising. My mom helped me move down to LA, 18 Mm -hmm. years old. I've lived on 4th and Spring. (laughs) Dude, (laughs) next door to Skid Row. It was a cool building. It was like 800 bucks a month. Yeah, but But it was fucking, dude, going from Beaverton to Oregon. In 2023, I can only imagine. It was so sketchy. Yeah. And it gave me a whole different view of the world. And, but I went to FITM. My world world was rocked. I was so depressed, dude. I I was alone. In, in Southern California, in LA at 18 years old. I didn't do drugs. I didn't drink. I didn't do anything. Yeah. I was strongly against all of that because yeah. I watched all my friends die and, you had and get lived stuck. That. You had seen yeah. enough of it. I where left like, that I can't. life. So there's yeah. no way. Yeah. But I went to fit. I'm thinking, I like clothes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 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 Actually, no, Jason Rush was my marketing teacher. And, and I, I was like, they're there's a graphic design course there that I was like, maybe I can do that. Mm-hmm. I don't resonate with traditional school. I went there for two weeks. I, w- I would cry myself to sleep though. And I would pray for meeting a girl because I needed something. I needed something. I needed to be fulfilled or loved or something. I needed somebody. Especially at, probably after you took a risk, left everything yeah. you knew in Portland, knew that that was not it. And now you're just fucking alone. You're I'm living in downtown LA with, with homeless crackheads everywhere. Yeah. Like crying myself to sleep, <laughs> listening to them like moan. I went to fit them for two weeks. I literally met my wife of like 10 years, my first wife. In the elevator. I've never met a girl in an elevator. Um, but that's when the universe started showing me, hey, it gives you what you actually b- want and what okay. you believe. Okay. When you really start manifesting your own existence. I, I quit school two weeks into it because I was in a fabric science class and I was like, I don't know what the fuck these people are talking about. This is weird. And I quit only because I found something else. I saw an ad for Music Business School. Am I? Musician Institute here in uh-huh. Hollywood, the Green Buildings. Oh, shit. I didn't know what that was. Yeah, yeah. That's funny. It's a full musician institute. Fuck. And I, there's a music business program there. And I was like, oh, I like music. And this was a really formative time in the in the record industry. Yeah. It was Napster. It was yeah. it was the, the whole wave of digital music coming in. And my first day at, at MI was I was tasked with um, getting an internship. And I was like, well, who do I like musically? Snoop Dogg. So I went to Doggy Style Records, which was at MCA, Music Corporation of America, the first record label in America. I went to the reception desk and said, hi, I'm James. I'd like an internship <laughs> with Snoop Dogg. One internship, please. One internship with Snoop Dogg, please. In walks Frank Cooper, Snoop's business manager. Perfect timing. The universe gave me the person I needed to talk to right then. That day I got an internship with Snoop. I worked for Snoop for a year and I saw the world differently because mm. like my hero, one of my heroes was like now uh, somebody that I interface with. Yeah. And it just started showing me that this is all kind of the game and that anything's possible. Mm-hmm. If you can work with Snoop Dogg, mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. can do anything. Yeah. Also, how beautiful is it that like something, some sacrifice you made, some leap of faith you made, it's like you come out to LA, you're fucking miserable. You're living in the sketchiest place, but you say, hey, I'm going to meet my wife here and you yeah. meet your wife. And then I'm going to go work for this record. I'm going to go work for Snoop Dogg. Like something clicks there. Right? Dude, yeah. And, right? and like weirdly, I hadn't met Snoop yet. The first time I met Snoop, believe it or not, this is when the universe starts showing up for me. Right. Because I'm like, I'm just going for it. Yeah. And believing in myself. Yes. I just un- wholeheartedly believe myself every step of the way because I, I, I've i seen the ceiling removed. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I, I see that this is all just a game. Yeah. And I, I, I just, I needed to talk to Snoop. Snoop wasn't in the office much for like the first few months. And I was like, I got to meet this guy. And I'm walking in to pay my rent at the old bank district lofts and walk Snoop Dogg. I hear chains like 
walking. And at the time, that was like 50 cents. Snoop, like everybody was wearing big chain. And it's Snoop walking at me. And I'm like, oh my God, it's Snoop. And he walks right up the stairs. And I didn't, he had bodyguards with him. And I didn't get a chance to talk to him. I waited for him. He was there seeing a girl. And they were like, you trust me, dog, you should just go. I'm like, no, no, I work for him. I work for Frank. And they're like, all right. And I was like, I just want to say hi. And they're like, all right. And they like rolled their eyes. And I waited and waited and waited and waited. He comes out and I'm like, hey, Snoop, what's up? I'm I'm James. I work for I work for you. And we then we like had this like amazing conversation and hit it off. But like that's when the world started showing me that like things just start working in your favor. My last day at, at MCA Records, I came in you know, dredged the traffic all the way out there. And the woman that was in charge of me was like, hey, uh, will you clean that office? And then that office? And then that, that office and that office? I get done cleaning the office. And then I, I, I look at her and she's like, okay, you're done. And I was like, done? And then she's like, yep. And I, by then I had fizzled out of MI and I just was lost. I went back to Oregon oh, to, pursue, to pursue racing. I okay. needed it. Stacy went with me. I, I quit. I, I was realizing the record industry is fucked. And are we posy mindset, James, at this point? At yeah. this point, are you like, I can make anything happen. Yes. I found my wife of and course. I met Snoop Dogg. So I'm definitely going to just course. go be a race car driver. Of course. Okay, cool. Yeah. Within th- like th- three months of being there, I I'd, I'd started real estate school and did oh. real estate because I was I found efficiencies and was able to do this work really quickly mm-hmm. and finished real estate school and released a Range Rover Sport 2004. Or 2005 or something, right when they first came out. Yeah, that new body style. New body style was clean. I've leased a Range Rover because like the whole fake it till you make it thing yeah, was burnt very, in my brain. And like real it's estate very, is bigger in that too. Well, I just needed to make money is what I needed. Like I knew I needed to make money so I could pursue the car thing. Uh, within three months, I was the top, one of the top agents within the Lake Oswego, Oregon, like super bougie office where super traditional people were selling real estate because I disrupted, Yeah, you know? I took what I learned in the music industry, mm-hmm. built a flash website. Mm-hmm. I, I had a business card that was super clean without my picture on it. I, I came up with a tagline, pearlrealtor.com, honest driven professional, helping people realize their dreams one home at a time. Yeah, I just faked it. That led to me being a really successful real estate agent within yeah. no time at all. It disrupting every step of the way. Okay. Like, that gave me the ability to go lease a race car. I leased an E46 M3. Cut it up immediately. Wait, wait. Lease a race car <laughs> means you went and bought an E46 M3 yeah. when it was brand new and cut it apart. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was hectic. I mean, and that used to be, a, imagine how scary that was for me at the time. Racing, learning to race with a car that was the biggest investment I've ever made. Okay, question though. Yeah. Because I've, well, two questions. One, if you're that successful at real estate, People normally stop there. Like that's a very respectable career that's making good money. And this is like the beginning of your career. Like, did you ever stop and be like, why don't I just leave it here? I was just dead set on being being a bigger version of myself and I'm wanting to race cars. Like I really, really, really wanted to race cars. That's interesting to me. Don't you think that says a lot about you? Like uh, I think a lot of people can get a taste of like money and security and be like, you know what? I remember this my first good. like four thousand dollar check from mm-hmm. like closing a house and I was like, four thousand dollars. It's mine. Yeah. And then I got like a seven thousand dollar check. And then I got like a twelve thousand dollar check. And then I was like, oh, I gotta pay taxes. <laughs> <laughs> but like it was cool. Like it gave me the ability. It was a really cavalier time too, because I was young and dumb and my ex was working at Widening Kennedy. Okay. Where I learned a lot about marketing. They started the just do it campaign, you know, it's oh, like fuck. core of Portland. Yeah. One of Dan Wyden's famous sayings is walk in stupid every day. And that's what I try to do with anything. Don't yeah, take any preconceived notions of how things are supposed to be. Yeah. Do it your own way. Do it what what is right for you. Yeah. And and so, and don't carry any other people's baggage with you. Okay. Well, yeah. So that answers that. But yeah. then my other side of that is now. The James that I know that I wouldn't, I don't put that past you at all to go buy a brand new car and cut it up and turn no. it into a race car and not be afraid There's of it. There'd be but, zero fear about that. But at the time it was scary. And I, I had some big moments where I almost crashed or did crash. Uh-huh. I used to drive it to the track, but uh-huh. I, I found out, I mean, it was good. It led to just committing my life to racing yeah. and, and I've, I've been committed since then. And I've, I've had to send it. And I say that word loosely. It's, I know had to go Jared's for it. listening to this right now, being like, "Fuck yeah, yeah, yeah send, yeah, it. Yeah, send <laughs> it!" Hi, Jared. But I, but I say that in the sense <laughs> I've had to go for it every step of the way and start over time and time again. And every step of the way, I've gotten checked. 
every step of the way, like every step of the way until most recently, like I, I constantly am getting fucking checked because it gives me the, 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 the uncomfortability to be a better version of myself again. How the fuck do you keep doing that? Like, how do you? Well, because it's not like you because, get loose checks. Like you've had life fucking shook. I, I guess when I, as I'm telling you this story of like learning to race cars and, and yeah. like going for it, like I, every step of the way was uncomfortable. Like, and the I'm, reason I'm, I'm, I'm leveraging everything. I remember like the messy folder of fucking real estate files where I'm like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. I can't organize the shit, but I'm going for it. Like I am trying so hard yeah. to keep going. The reason that I'm checking you, the reason that I'm like pushing and yeah. being like, you didn't want to quit. Like you kept sending it. You kept having the fearlessness. I keep pushing because like you give me that assurance. Yeah, I appreciate that. And it's like, I think we're all like, that's so hard to do. And you set that example so well that I'm almost nudging you being like, come on, prove it. Like you had to have wanted to break, like whatever, just because I'm so inspired yeah, yeah, and impressed by it. Does that make sense? Yeah, I you for sure. I appreciate you saying that. Like, I just kept going for it. I don't know. I, I like this endless idea of like success for myself. And I want, I just wanted this. And I guess the key for me is doing what makes me happy. Sure. And it's oh. a very simple thing, but I'm doing what makes me happy. Mm -hmm. Racing made me happy. Selling real estate quickly led to buying real estate. So I had like a lot of front doors at one point, at least 10 front doors at one time where I was renting or flipping or I was, I was buying and selling um, mid-century houses and I fell in love with architecture. I was good at racing and I, I kept doing it and winning and, and getting opportunities and not very many opportunities in Portland, Oregon. I'll tell you that. Mm -hmm. It's it's a very isolated racing community yeah. and, and, and the people there are annoyed by the noise of race cars. Mm. You know, it's like really weird yeah. thing. So I knew at some point I needed to pick up and leave. Mm. I I caught wind that there was a Volkswagen Jetta TDI Cup. It's mm -hmm. it's a first ever green race series. Mm. And it's SCCA Pro was putting on this, sanction, sanctioning this race series. The Volkswagen was funding a lot at the, in search for drivers. They were doing them in Europe. And there was a, a, a submission process. The submission process was make make a video telling us why you're, you should be eligible for this. My, my best friend at the time, my first friend, Eric Anderson, he went to USC film school. He was the most woke dude I know. Like he was the one who turned me vegan. I've been vegan for 17 years. That's the guy. Yeah, Eric Anderson. And uh, was actually living in one of my properties with me no at the way. time. And um, I was like, hey, dude, I'm going to go racing. Let's let's figure out how to get me in. Will you make me a video? We made, came up with a business concept. I remember we put those giant post-it notes all over this mid-century house we were living in. So uh -huh. all the glass around the atrium it was these post-it notes. And we were just like, Riffing. going yeah, yeah. and it, and we came up with crowdfunding before crowdfunding was crowdfunding holy fuck we called it your sponsor here.com we we're like we'll get the community to sponsor this it's the first ever fuck. green race series the future of sponsorship is individuals empowering other people that's what we came up with it was before any other crowdfunding websites before any of it so we were like dude we're on to something this is the future of of how we how people fund things so we bought your sponsor here.com paid a guy that i met through jason resh to design a logo it's this pink logo then we went did made a video of us pitching it to people with a like a, a like a handy cam like we were just like but he was a film yeah, student so yeah, we, so we had good editing work. we had like this cardboard sign i put a race suit on in the forest i grew up racing bmx bikes in and it was like i believe in the power of i uh, the power of the individual and the power of the individual to empower other people to dream and it was in this whole campaign we came up with um that volkswagen loved this is so on brand with who you are as yeah. a person too so like you really have been the james i know yeah. for a long time i pitched it to barack obama he was he was running for president at the time of course I, you did of i had just been did. accepted to it and i was still was grinding i had sold everything i had to to fund it i was the six, houses and shit yeah yeah well and also this is 2008 so oh. the economy was fucked and country, my home loans were all countrywide so like i was feeling it my birthday july 25th uh-huh Home track. Circus is coming to town. The circus is coming and you got and it. I, You're I, in. I sold a fucking tur a biodiesel sponsorship. I I was scraping by. So the first race, I get doored on both sides. First race, back you up. Guess, guess who's putting cameras on my car for the first race of the Volkswagen Jetta TDI Cup? 30 seconds before the race starts, there's this guy fumbling in a Ziploc bag. It's Nick Woodman, the founder of fucking GoPro. Stop it. He's sponsoring me. The universe said, align that. And, and, um, he, he and I kept in touch over the years, but that day he put cameras on my car and there was chaos that ensued in front of me. It was on ESPN Sports Center. It was at Vir Virginia International Raceway. It was like full fucking melee. We got footage nobody's ever seen before from a camera that nobody's ever seen before. 
like car undersides of cars flipping. And it was this hectic race that guess what? In that series, you have to pay for your crash damage. I had like $60,000 of crash damage the, over the, the first two races. And anyway, long story short, I scraped everything I had together, sold everything I had, begged, borrowed, steeled, got more sponsors, still was shy like $7,000. And Clark Campbell, the director of motorsport for Volkswagen at the time, who I still are passive across multiple times over the last couple of decades, denied me racing. No. Yeah. Off of like 7K? But yeah. They didn't have my crash damages paid. I'd literally leveraged my entire life and everything I had at this point. Mind you, I had 10 properties that I had like gotten rid of, sold, done everything I could to just continue racing. And here I was, thought I made it. And and I, my home track, when all, all I had done so much PR for that series, I had done news stories. The local news came out multiple times. It was the most humiliating thing ever in my life. I was kicked out of the series. On your birthday. On my birthday. My home track where I was finally going to really fucking shine. This is like my track. And I I pulled out what I still had to race. And it was the day I met Ryan Turk and Chris Forsberg. No. And, and, those, and Jared Nianda and, no. and Andy Laputka. I, I was like, who the fuck are these drifter guys? Like, why are they here? This is sports car racing, not drifting. These yeah. cars are stupid. They're yeah. loud. I don't, why are they smoking that's not up going our around track? It. Yeah, that doesn't go yeah. around and the I track was the fastest. bitter as fuck because they were literally, I remember sitting there with my Volkswagen suit being shunned because they were racing the pro race and I was sitting in the parking lot with the drifters with my E46 that I still owned. Those guys remember it that day like it was yesterday because they were like literally gridded up next to me with like, there was like a hundred cars there. Yeah. And somehow I ended up right next to them. And they, looking back, we don't know why that interaction happened because we didn't like connect. Yeah. But they they were like, then their eyes was like, who the fuck's this weird kid with like this E46 race this car? Race car. Yeah. Um, That's so crazy. It's everything keeps happening like that too my whole life. Every, the universe is just exactly perfect. So do you think that there's something in that? Like, I feel like as I get older, I learn like the moments that you think are catastrophic happen in this way where in the moment they are catastrophic yeah. but then in retrospect and as the universe plays out it's the best thing that ever happened because of some other totally like if i would have just made it through to the next race at volkswagen jetta tbi cup where the fuck would i be i wouldn't trade my life for anything for yeah the, you know I, I've, I've been challenged every step of the way to be who i am today and it's given me this ability to like see the life in a really fucking special way like i have this shield that i carry i feel like i get, i've been graced with because yeah. of the pain and the challenges that yeah. that was that was devastating though i remember i was at the noodles and company in beaverton oregon when clark campbell and i had a fucking falling out and i had gun real estate i had sold like 100 houses i had, like i had done everything for that this moment. was your moment like and, this is like young and i was kid. like smacked again like nope and then i was like what the fuck am i gonna do now move back to california because guess what I knew the Long Beach Grand Prix was here. I knew Oregon wasn't going to get me anywhere. I didn't know anything about how to make it in racing. I just kept going for it. I met Bastion. No that way. Weekend, Long Beach Grand Prix. I knocked on the Porsche Motorsport door and said, hi, I'm James. I want to drive for you. From that moment, I just kept going. And I, I didn't know what the fuck I was going to do. My grandpa dies. I guess where my grandpa's from. Originally, North Carolina, where he wants to be buried. Never been out there before. So my what grandpa, while I'm that, that same week, an F1 team said they were going to start in, in North Carolina. One of the announcers from Speed Channel had announced it. And so I was like, whoa, North Carolina is really like a place. And there was wind tunnels and like, oh, the, the, the manufacturing out there for, for textile industry is all turned into composite manufacturing. So there was a real industry of, of, of racing out there. And I was like, oh, that's where people go to race. Yeah. Picked up and moved. Moved, drove across the fucking country while Stacy was still living and taking care of her mom who had just passed or she was taking care of her, her mom hadn't passed and, yet yeah. but I drove across the country again and went to North Carolina no idea what I was doing just went for it like just went to the racetracks just started going and then was like okay I gotta learn circle track racing so I, I took whatever money I had left paid for a thousand dollar race rental and then tried to circle track race but that race that like those were the formative years of like really getting to know the industry because like Emerson Fittipaldi's grandson Pietro who's still racing was on the grid next to me Chase Elliott was on the grid next to me who's now the NASCAR cup champion like mm -hmm. Nelson PK Jr. was in that race V8 supercar drivers were in that race and we're in the middle of fucking nowhere Hickory North Carolina where NASCAR drivers cut their teeth and so I fucking grinded it out for a year doing short track racing and it was the hardest shit I'd ever done but it was so fun
and so fulfilling. And I just blind faith went for it. And I just let the universe kind of guide me and was open to these opportunities. I, I, Twitter was new. Everybody kept telling me, you need to meet this guy, Jacob. I'm like, he's mm-hmm. cool. And you're cool. He's cool. He's from California. And everybody kept telling me that. There was like one cool store that, yeah. you know, in North Carolina, in Charlotte. And I remember having to deliberately be like, I'm going to find this Jacob guy. Yeah. And like found him. Jacob Chills. I was like, wow. This it was cool. still Jacob Chills. <laughs> he, had a blo- he had a full blog. It was Jacob Chills. And it was, it was just a really simple blog that he had a, his creative director make a logo. So it was like this cool like logo that said Jacob Chills. And he just put cool pictures of stuff he liked. It's so chill. It was so chill. <laughs> but but that was the time when in Twitter you just write, hey, I just went to Harris Teeter. They got new pickles. Yep. You, you know, yeah. you just yeah. write what you were doing. Totally. And I remember being able to track him a little bit. And he like in the NASCAR races in town. And I was racing a lot at the time. Yeah. I was good too. Yeah. You know? And I, and I was carding a lot too and beating beating people. And I remember I beat Kimmy Reichen and smoked. No his ass. way. Yes. <laughs> Dude, we were racing so much. We were doing 24-hour endurance races and indoor karting, dude. No way. I was in the best shape of my life, only racing and volunteering at the, the inner city school, and that's it. How many lives? Are, you're like at like 20, easy. So you're out there. I'm out there, man. You find Jacob. There's a race in town. Yeah. Sneak my way into the track because I don't have tickets. We're yeah. pretty broke at this time. I went out to the race and tw- tweeted Jacob. I was like, hey, I'm here. He's like, hey, come down to pit stall, whatever, whatever. And he's there with his dad. And, and I don't even know the, the depth of this at the time, but I know that they're like the people and they're like an equal to an Andretti in this this world. Yeah, yeah. Like the name Agajanian yeah. carries weight. Yeah, I snuck my way into this with the SCCA Pro Drivers Pass. And yeah. I'm like... I used to do that with uh, yeah, music shit. Like you something. have one tour pass and you're yeah. just like, it's me. Yeah. yeah. And they let me in. And I'm anyway, just that's the first time I met Jacob. And at the time I, I resented Jacob for this and I've talked to him about it, but... He told me I wasn't, I couldn't do it, you know, mm. and that, that got me. Mm. And he was probably one of the only people that I let that get to me because everybody was saying that mm. at the time. But this was because the, the economy you... was fucked and NASCAR was going from like big, big salaries to everybody coming in to the sport was coming in with big paychecks. They were coming in with rich, deep pockets. It's funny too because I can see that because it's like, this is a dude you've respected or this is a dude you understand is a guy that like gets it. Yeah. And now knowing Jacob, he probably didn't say it in a way of like ill will. He's just so real. Like he's probably just like, who the fuck is this guy? Like, yeah. He didn't do the th- I, and it happened the way it was supposed to be i still carried resent for that for a long time up until recently and even the way i just said yeah <laughs> i resented it I, I still carry some resent and i've told him that and and it's okay it's all healthy like if you identify those things because yeah. it's just a basic re- reaction but what it did was it put me where i'm supposed to be yes and and it wouldn't be who i am today i have zero regrets in my life i followed that 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 my heart though and kept true to myself and disrupted every step of the way like uh, you know, I'm doing short track racing. I'm still running on fumes. I'm still like, how the fuck do you get sponsors? Jacob's telling me it's not possible. Carting every fucking chance I get. We're 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 out there because I need to innovate, and I I'm like doing creative work. I'm vlogging for myself. I'm doing getting like creative sponsors. I'm doing everything possible to keep sponsors and to like make myself relevant. So I'm like putting myself out there. I called Ryan Davis up from high school. It was no three race fucking with. way. He's like, yo, I need to make content. And I see that you just did a rollerblading video. And I saw that you went drifting. DSLRs had just come out. And so he came out and like, we didn't really hadn't spent time together in a while. And he filmed a sick pipe video for me. And I was like working out and racing. And it was sick. Like it was good. Yeah. And, and yeah. the Agajanians have gave me a job. I was doing uh, PR work, like just okay. the hustling. I was working for a Porsche team. And uh, it put me in the, the, the conversation though. And, and I was able to, you know, do sim races all week long with all the NASCAR drivers in the, at the agency. And, and it, well, it was, I was there, Ryan and I didn't even know it, but we, we innovated, we, I, we, we made content, we made content that changed the world. Yeah. Like we just were doing it to keep racing. You know, I was. It was and, a necessity. Yeah. It wasn't some grand master no, plan. No, 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 not at all. Have I explained to you like how I found his original content on Tumblr back in the day? Yeah. How like it blew my mind. Like Florida kid that was into like yeah. elevated cars and like you'd see these crushed black and these super <laughs> cinematic edits of cars yeah. and I was like, this is possible? Like, yeah. what? Yeah. And that's just y'all. Like I'm hearing this yeah. now and I'm like, oh, it's we just my friends trying to figure out. We didn't know what we were doing. He's a genius with visuals, you know? Yeah. Like, 
but he doesn't know what he's doing. I mean, in, in the, the sense best of, way. In the right. sense of we don't know what the fuck we're doing. Right. We're just like, doing our best. Doing the best doing and doing what we, we think is cool and not being worried about what other people think. Yeah. And and yeah, so he made a video for me. We made we made Porsche videos where we continued to interface with Bastion. Stop it. No y- Yeah, way. we continued to interface. We did interviews with all the heads of Porsche because I was bold enough to go to Road Atlanta, take him to Road Atlanta with me who had never been to a race before. He had never been, you know, and I'm like, yeah, right? yeah no, he had not been around any kind of professional racing. And oh, I'm, I'm wow. like, dude, okay, we're going to go to the racetrack. Oh, I get it though. Yeah. Because he was street he racing was, and like rollerblading. Roller it's blading different. Blading. Yeah. It's, it's, it would be, it would be like me. Yeah. Like I knew cars, I knew Hondas, I knew sports, but like I didn't really we go to races. We walked in stupid as fuck. We yeah. rented a, we rented a 400 in Wisconsin and, and just disrupted. I mean, he and I were on a flight to, from a Southwest Airlines flight to Vegas for SEMA to go sell sponsors. He was going to because he, he, we were making videos and we wanted to sell the video stuff too. This was, we were pioneers in content now looking at it. Like yeah. we got to be the first wave of automotive content. You were. Yeah. The reason I can say that with such confidence is like you influenced young me. Yeah. I accidentally found your shit because it was the best. It was fucking sick. And and by necessity, we were just doing what we loved and continuing to try to make it work. Stickers on the sides of race cars weren't working anymore. So we had to make content. We had to do stuff to make ourselves relevant. Wow. Yeah. And we just kept going. And so I was doing this job I hated working at this Porsche team that didn't respect me, that kept yeah. dangling the care to me, testing for right, them. Right. But we made the content. And Jalopnik picked it up. You know, no way. This was early days too. This was like early YouTube days. We were making content for Streetfire.net before YouTube existed. Like, oh my and God. Jacob was and Turk and Vaughn and all those guys were pioneering automotive content. And I was just kind of like the weird new kid that they called Famous James, that was just like trying to make it in racing. And everybody doubted me. Yeah. And every step of the way, and that's what I learned. They always will. Yeah, but now like the people are coming around like even yeah. yesterday parker klingerman he's mm-hmm. like yeah I, i'll be honest with you i didn't think you guys would do it and he's like an nbc he's a full-time announcer driver an nbc sports announcer and he said you guys made racing cool and they, he said that to us yesterday you guys made racing cool you did it and and fuck there's people like that that i don't even know yeah we just know yeah. of each other and that are well, finally recognizing that and then it's like whoa we didn't even know. No. We didn't even know we did it. Like, uh, we don't even know we did it. Uh, and, and it's just because we stayed true to, to what was pure for us. Oh, my God. It gives me goosebumps did, because it's like I was a person that discovered it. It felt not only revolutionary, but it felt validating because to me, I didn't even know that I wanted that. But I was like, this is a thing I love. And thanks for for like showing me that it can look this cool and that mm. you can do it like this. It's crazy because even at that time, like when we were all kind of just trying to figure it out, you look at the group we have now, it yeah. was all the pioneers of that g- generation. Yes. yes. Have Rod Chong, who like invented Speed, Speed Hunters, Hunters, which like, was like, that was where we went for an outlet. Yeah. Like, and wasn't that a necessity of like- And that inspired us to make the beautiful Porsche videos that Jalopnik put on. <laughs> and guess what Jalopnik did? The Jalopnik article that said the most beautiful racing video of all time or of this year, they put us on the front of their website. And Ryan and I landed the plane. And we're like, what the fuck? Like people are watching. Like, and and guess what that got me? GoPro called me. I kept in touch with Nick, the founder, and and but now they're like, we're this thing's becoming real. No, and we need way. somebody to come make motorsports our a major pillar for us. Come help us. So guess who's like reluctantly quitting racing to go help be the part of the original crew of GoPro? Like I I had to hang up my boots and quit racing as I knew it to go to GoPro, and I hated it. I regretted every second of it at the time. Yeah, it was so I had to swallow all my pride. And pack up another fucking U-Haul and move across the fucking country. Dude, you know what's also weird that I'm thinking about right now? Is like it's almost a curse that you're accidentally good at a lot of things. Mm. Because like your passion can sometimes get hijacked. But you know what? It's because I know that we can all be good at anything. I wasn't good at editing videos at the time. Uh. I wasn't. Uh. But they hired me to be a media person in motorsport. Like to build GoPro and motorsports. Yeah. But I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. I never opened a fucking Ryan Ryan will test to this. Ryan barely knew how to edit at the time. Yeah. You know, he was beautiful at it. He's right. a fucking savant. But somehow we made it work. It's not like you some crazy formal education. No. This, this. It was just you had a No, but there. the worst part about it was I flew out to to San Fran- San Francisco to meet with them and I was like, I hated every second of it. It was me giving up. 
It was everything I didn't want to do. Fuck. I know. And I swallowed my fucking pride. I walked in. We were in a townhouse. They were in a townhouse at the time. And they were like so excited to have me there. Like, you're so good at this. They're like, they're all film students and like fucking marketing people and like surfers and shit. And I was like the weird racing guy that's cool that doesn't know that like, Fuck, that make, dude. And I didn't, I, dude, I had to just pretend like I knew. They were like, here, like, here's some footage. Go make some stuff. They made me make an edit to prove myself. I'm like, wait, I'm not an editor. Like, Fuck. so I took a bunch of GoPro footage and figured out how to edit of Nick Woodman, the founder racing, yeah. the same person who was putting yeah. cars on my race car yeah. of him racing. To make an edit and it was miserable. Because you're like, Sick. this is, this Remember is when not, I was this doing is whack. Thing. Like every step of it. But Jacob had just gotten a job at Wasserman. Uh -huh. He had left North Carolina. Stacy and I were still like trying to figure our shit out. We moved into Jacob's apartment and, no and we're renting it from him. And I was like, fuck, I'll take this job. Let's go. It's a it's an early tech industry job. You know, her brother was out there. I gave everything up and and we moved to fucking across the country again. I got there and I carried a chip on my shoulder, but I disrupted the entire way. I carried it, walked in stupid and I didn't care about how they did things. Yep. And I was like, I'm going to do it my way and yep. I'm not going to let you slow me down. Yep. And my team is still the team that runs the, the fucking media department, the team I built. And that's when I learned the importance of community. It took a long time to really accept this opportunity. And so I carried the chip on my shoulder and I fought a lot. Like I saw people being yes, but I saw corporate culture killing the brand. I saw like the negatives of yes men and all these people that swarm popularity and su success. And I fought the whole way. I, I would have stand up arguments to st with Nick Woodman, the founder in front of the whole board to, you know, to, to do it the right way. Yes. You know, to do it the right way. And I was respected for that. And, and I was, yeah, I got to be a part of one of the biggest waves of a brand in history. Like when we got there, we were not on the map and within a very short amount of time, we were the number one brand on YouTube. Oh my and, God. And, and the second brand, Eight Minute Abs. The third brand, Red Bull. We had built, Red Bull was a dream. If we could beat Red Bull, like GoPro was built off of Red Bull's model. Like and we, everybody admits that. We brought yeah. executives from GoPro, like are from Red Bull. Like it was like, that was the idea of how to build a dope brand. And, and we surpassed them on rate YouTube ratings. And guess what? They were so uncomfortable with it that they had their lawyers remove them from the list completely. No way. Yeah. Looking back and confidently and not co cocky, like we pioneered automotive content and content in general. I got to be a yes. part of the brand that probably influenced the world with content more than any other brand. And also a part of the most viral videos of uh, campaign of all time, which leads me to my next point when I was bitter and spiteful and walked Ken Block the newest investment at GoPro. No way. I got to be a part of all of that stuff. And no what way. Ken, what Ken taught me. Cause you did all the Jim Connors. I did stuff. all the Jim Connors. And, and so I got to be the on good set for the GoPro and I led the GoPro charge for what? Five Jim Connors. Oh and, my God. And what Ken immediately taught me was you can go racing on your own terms. So to me, my vision's still not faded. I'm like, Oh, okay. I'm going to go racing on my own terms. Aww. And so I have to be an entrepreneur. And so I was spiteful because I was seeing the chaos within GoPro mm -hmm. and the success that was coming. Yep. And I was like, I'm smarter than this. I'm smarter than that guy. Why am I not doing this for myself? And I kept going. And looking back, I got to travel the world and do amazing things. Yeah. And it, it led me to where I am today. Again, no regrets. But yeah. Ken gave me this power of do it on your own terms. Yeah. Be bold again. Yeah. And I swallowed my pride and was at GoPro for four years and watched it become a multi-billion dollar company. I got to spend a week in Thailand w with my heroes, including Michael Schumacher, like the people I grew up idolizing. Ironically, the, 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 the downfall of GoPro started um, when Michael Schumacher's head injury um, right. became public. And, right. and, and there was like and controversy his son, around it. The controversy GoPro, was that right? the GoPro camera yeah. caused the problem. And it was a GoPro camera that I gave him. Jesus. And so life again comes full circle where I'm like, what the fuck? It's Stop like you couldn't it. you couldn't write this. And the GoPro stock dropped 30% that day. Guess what? I watched everybody else get rich. Yeah. And I was in a lockout period just by a few months. I worked my fucking ass off at GoPro. I worked yeah. my ass off. Yeah. When you work at a company like that, startups that are like up mm. and coming, you can you almost choose to get a lower salary and just get fucking no, just, stacked in stock. You, well, in the spirit of those startups, and this was like a wave of that whole Silicon Valley 
come up was like you in order to to bring in talent you offer stock and yeah. and, and it's it's totally normal like yeah. in that world and of course i got offered stock and it was yeah. like wow that's cool that was one of the reasons only reasons i did it was because right. i'm investing in myself and th- right. i saw yeah. that there was in game in that for yeah. and i could go racing again yeah I mean, oh right yeah, and that's right. where the idea came from for a race service i was going to sonoma a lot and mm-hmm. it's beautiful wine country it's close to san francisco i love san francisco i got to ride my bicycle all over the place i became a cyclist a motorcyclist there was a really dope racetrack right there no connection to the city it was just really disconnected car culture and there was all these wineries that were beautiful but nothing really to do I'm like, huh. why isn't there this kind of hospitality like a winery uh-huh. like a really dope winery yeah at the racetrack that should be cool and right. there's not and racetracks feel like shitty skate parks where there's a vending machine and they're a terrible. chip machine like, there were a bunch yeah. of, they just don't focus on any of those details yeah. so i came up with the concept kirkham race house i wrote it in a journal and it was like this elevated approach to racing and jacob and i had talked about starting an agency for years at the time and so we had this plan that once we run our course at our at our GoPro and him at Wasserman, that we were going to collectively start something together. Yeah. While I was working at GoPro, doing all the gym contests, traveling the world, meeting all my heroes, they do, burning out, I burnt a relationship and a family because of my career, you know, in hindsight. You know, I, I, I committed to my career more than I did my family. And, Damn. and 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 it's you know live and learn but Man, i say that so to say many... that sacrifices you just constantly sacrifice i was coming down to california a lot for different jobs i was down here for gymkhana la mm. the director of gymkhana was ben conrad ben conrad is who we started donut with jacob was like i met this guy ben it, you know he's been talking to brian scotto and ken block mm-hmm. we're going to start a company together they want to call it donut Jacob and I committed to doing this together. And I was like, all right, I guess I'm going to leave GoPro. Michael Schumacher injury happened, stock dropped. I'm like seeing the end in the stock option thing. And I'm like, what the fuck? The the company had lost its soul. There was like all these people that came in to help bring it public. And it was like corporate culture all of a sudden. Yeah. And And isn't it like the way you explain it is like, you watch your friends buy all the crazy like yeah, Porsches and totally. nuts cars, and you're like, okay, cool, I can like. I don't it know, still wasn't maybe there pay for some me. Bills yeah, for a couldn't even bit. do that. Like, I couldn't even didn't have enough to do that. I didn't make any money. One of my last weeks there, Nick, the founder, offered me to come out and do race trophy trucks in Colorado on his jet. Go to San Jose Airport, have this epic day driving trophy trucks. But at the same time, I'm the only not billionaire there i'm not only, only not made it guy i'm the youngest one there and it was kind of ousted like the, it was kind of like the work the help you know yeah. but nick and i were homies like he treated he always treated me right and but i just felt like and i knew i was quitting that day i had to tell nick that was my my he was a busy guy at the time and i was like i'm i get some one-on-one with him i'm gonna i have to tell him today the whole flight home we're chasing the sunset back to san jose from colorado and they're making this epic meal and i'm like nervous and i'm like and also I got kind of shunned on the meal. Like those little things that like, I'm like, it's wait, a, am I we're like, all the same, yeah, except you're except just a little different. Not. Go sit on yeah. that bed instead of a seat. So I'm like, you know, <sighs> what the fuck? And I'm like, just like defeated again. Yeah. Defeated. Yeah. Like how much have I given to everybody? And I'm still getting shit on. Yeah. Like that was a moment. And I don't really give it that, that often. But right now, as I'm telling you this, that was a defeated moment. And the way I tell it is usually not that. I appreciate you telling it like that because your whole story is a story of positivity and it's me poking you and asking like, come on, you had to have been defeated Dude, before. Every step of the way, it was defeated. Yeah. And that that moment, the jet lands, like the owner of the 49ers was there, like all these like, <laughs> all the, the old time, PJ dude. crew. Yeah, they're like, see you later. And I'm like, let me gather my belongings. And Nick's at the front of the jet and love you, Nick, if you watch this. Uh, I've, I've, yeah, I've, had, I've nothing but respect for this man. It gave me the inspiration to do what I'm doing. Yeah, but I, I, I get to the front of the jet. His GT2 that I spitefully snart at every mm-hmm. day. It was always filthy. He just railed that car. I love it now. Looking in hindsight, it's so sick. But so yeah, sick. yeah, was 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 sitting there with the jet spooling still, and he's like waiting to like give me daps, give me a big hug, and he's like fuck, and he's this dude is the most full of life dude in the world. We get to the front of the jet. I gives me daps, and he goes, "Fuck, we made it." And I literally go, "Nah, you made it, man. I gotta go. I gotta do it for myself." And he's like, "Huh?" And he's like, "What do you mean?" And I was like, "Yeah, man. I'm so grateful for this opportunity, but I'm moving on, and I have to do something for myself. I'm an entrepreneur like you, and I have to." And he was like, "No, what?" And we talked for hours. He sat me in his car. 
and gave gave me like very very heart to heart about like my intentions between this and who we're doing it with and 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 he and he shared his fears that he's he was echoing about GoPro with me and he gave me really good advice and and sussed me out and was like that you're doing this yeah and and I and he he's like all right you I, I you're gonna be the first to go and thank you you know thank you for everything I'm walking away. He gives me his blessing and, I, and he literally like out of a movie he goes, Kirkham, you're gonna fucking win. And I was like, and it was like he was just like full of life. I fucking love that man. Straight up. Out love of that movie. man. Love that man. Just fucking dude, dude, dude came up with an idea to fucking take a coat. He took a Kodak film camera, went to a fucking manufacturer in China, leveraged he that dude tried over and over again with multiple companies, lost money every time, like failed so hard. Fail harder was another one of the sayings that Widen Kennedy taught. Nick Woodman failed harder until he came up with this idea to strap a, go- a fucking Kodak camera to his wrist. Yeah, he made he he made something really special of it and changed the world. That's the cool part. Yeah, you know, it did. It's, it did. It's inspired the world. That was our mission: was just to inspire people to be bigger. And it did. I had already committed, and yeah. and I was going to stick to that to donut with to chicken. donut. Yeah. So we started donut. Donut was another situation that taught us a lot about life where we thought we, we did something and succeeded again yes and then we're checked because like, it again. worked it worked it fucking worked and we built that motherfucker we yeah. worked our asses off we put everything we had learned our entire careers into making content into making relationships in motorsport third gen- jason jacobs family third generation motorsport yeah. poured all of those reputations everything into this brand and then we had a different opinion of what the future looked like for 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 ourselves yeah. with the other investors the other investors bless them uh, nothing but love for anybody and i try to approach any situation with life in yeah. life with that but they had a different vision for how their lives were going to look than yeah. ours and we wanted to invest into motorsport and automotive more long term and and more so around community we yeah. had been making multi-million views videos constantly yep Every, it just got hollow and then it was time to f- focus on community yeah like we, we wanted to invest in a space where people could gather and 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 where we could cultivate com- like a group of people that are passion driven that are yeah. living their full lives and yeah. and like giving themselves to something that actually will 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 reward them greater yeah. than they could even know like well, you be- said i mean it's community it's inside and outside it's yeah. people but then it's also like what is community it's people coming in from outside as well That's and it. building that stronger and you didn't feel that with donut no you no we make so many viral videos right? yeah it was hollow and and the community online was becoming um volatile because it was like change platforms would change all the time right. uh, trends would change all the time and you know what like Chasing trends on the internet, I'm not about that. Like, no. like I don't. I'm, that I, that's maybe why I don't consume content like I do. Like, I just it's like we've stayed true to ourselves to a to a fault. Yeah, and we don't chase the trends and we don't do the things that we probably should have done in other people's eyes. But we're true to ourselves and doing what we love, and it's we're integrity. at it's... the fucking table, dude. Twenty years, and dude, I finally have a manufacturer that's gonna support me to go racing. This this is the moment. Like, this is the this is why I wanted every bit of this story because it feels so special right now. Dude, it really is. Like we went to WME, the biggest talent agency in the world. Yeah. The universe put the, the founder of WME's son to work for us. So like what the, like completely randomly. Dude. And, and this, this relationship happened also completely randomly. Whereas we finally are realizing that we are actually wanted mm. and it's been a long time of people trying to convince people that we we know what's up and that we have an idea for how this sport could be better and how this industry could be better and how we can bring culture and fashion and expand the thing that we love to more places and well let me clarify though because you've proven that for a long time it's just been facilitating proving that through other people's things mm. so now that race service exists it's yeah. clearly and even race service, man. We've been we constantly have to swallow our pride and do it for other people. That's true, but it it led us to where we're at. No, and again, I say all this to say no regrets. Oh my god, no! It's amazing with donut with everything. It was always like with with GoPro. It was always kind of somebody else's thing, or at least it always. wasn't fully your thing. So now it's like, yeah, race service does agency work. Race service, like clearly, there's a lot of talent. You guys still have great ideas, and even and that we've had adversity. Like even internally, we we have challenges. Of obviously, it's really hard. 
to mm-hmm. do what we're doing and following your love and 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 also doing it with so many different personalities that are really good at what they do. Yeah. It's really hard and you know, but you grow every step of the way. Yeah. And like I'm so grateful to work alongside so many fucking talented people that are mm-hmm. living their full selves. Yeah. And there's nothing nothing more fulfilling than watching other people be fulfilled and it's taken this process to get to that point whereas like my fulfillment doesn't come from me getting Mm. things it's my fulfillment comes from watching other people get things meaning like growth and like seeing them become happy and become have a purpose and to provide like dude we have almost 50 employees worldwide (sighs) and we pay our bills kind of we don't have late bills anywhere that's dude we don't we're not we're not getting rich yet Maybe one day, but it's like, but because that, we follow dude. our heart and and do what's right, yeah, and we have a fucking empowered community of really amazing people. Everybody who walks through the doors says, "What the hell is wrong with this place?" Yeah, where did you find your employees? Where are these people from? Yeah. Are they from Chick Fil A? Are they from? That's the joke. Dude, I love that joke. joke. I think everybody's from Chick Fil A. <laughs> Andrew is from Chick Fil A. I think. <laughs> yeah, I think he's the founder of Chick Fil A. He's the secret boss. <laughs> <laughs> undercover bosses i'm just a fucking chick-fil-a franchisee because i have two things here yeah. that are crazy because the the two things that i think about is now finally it, it is a we of course it's a we but like finally bro like it is your company in the sense of like like your name is tied to it like you can't have the fucking person do the finesse thing and finagle you like it's your thing like you say race service and you know james kirkham and like you earned that and of course, others have earned that too. It is not just yeah. you, but like, but that's the best part about fucking it. Fucking is- God, like I, from the outside looking in, knowing my friend that has been through all this, you finally have your thing that is your thing. Dude, it's crazy. And it's taken everything to be here. Yes. There's nothing that could have brought us here besides that. Yes. There's literally no regrets. There's an element of this that's, that's, that's fueled by that desire the chip on to your be. shoulder. Yeah. The, yeah. You know, I live with like this full faith that everything's great. I have manifested a fucking beautiful existence and I have a really beautiful wife that inspires me to be big and to challenges me when I'm small, that calls me to hire every step of the way that it's so annoying, <laughs> that has a fucking incredible life experience that is unmatched. Yeah. Equal to my incredible unmatched life experience. I, I had to go through it to get there. I lost. I, I destroyed my other family yeah. that I loved. And yeah. that's a sacrifice that I made and, and, I'm, and I accept mm-hmm. at this point in my life. Mm. It's, we have to accept when we've done things that have hurt other people. And I did, th- I did that. I, I committed to this. Yeah. It was really hard for mm. me to, to not have a relationship with my daughter in the same city. And, but what I learned through that yeah. process is that it's perfect. Yeah. My relationship with my nine-year-old daughter, Ren, is the best relationship I could possibly ever have with a nine-year-old daughter named Ren. Yeah. Like, we are the best ever. Yeah, and it are. is exactly how it's meant to be. And we had to go through a lot of pain. She still goes through pain. I still go through pain. Yeah. There's that's what like missing is. birthdays, missing things, but I'll do anything for them. And Well, I have two things. So it's like, one, I think with great risk comes great reward. I'm thinking about your life. I'm thinking about everything you're explaining. I'm thinking about your beautiful family. I'm thinking about all the now what we can talk about. And I don't think you would have had that great reward had you not taken those risks. There is a version of you that could have just put your feet up and sold mid-century modern homes and been like the local fastest lap in Portland (laughs) and been happy with that. The reason that this all came to be is because James never could have fucking done that. You accidentally created the monster of media and like social media and the following because you guys were doing what was right to you, making dope videos. 10 years ago, that was it. That was the sauce. Now necessity is doing what's authentic and And pushing these boundaries. Yeah, exactly. The sauce sauce is just being like this. Yeah. You know what I mean? The sauce is just being on this side, being like, "Eh." like, I'm going to lean this way. Y'all are going to be right here in the little safe zone. We're going to go like this. And just being confident, being confident with that. Yeah. And not, and not not being scared. Like right now, this campaign with Mercedes Benz that's coming to life. It's like I pinch myself. We're at the table with the executives and Will yeah. I am. And like we're actually being heard finally. Yeah. You know, in so many years, in so many decades, we've given the sauce to people. And now we're like, wait a second, 
we got it not mm-hmm. them just because they have the followers mm-hmm. you know followers don't have value yeah. followers don't have the value as authenticity in the sauce now. no bless the, the the age of social media because it gave us the empowerment to be an individual yep. it's taken the power away from corporations and record labels yep it's given the power back to the people that are doing the stuff yep. and it's made us recognize that the agencies kill brands and that the corporations n- need to be attached to free thinking human beings like us that can give them the sauce. And we're in that really cool phase where Virgil and, and, and Kanye and, and all those people paved the way for us. And, and quite literally race service, we are on the track of Virgil. Dude. And I, Uh, we're making the clothes in the same factories. We're doing the same (laughs) shit. We have the same circle of people trying to come at us right now. We're we're talking to the same retail stores to launch our brand. Like we are there, but, and like, think about no, what, automotive agency or brand or whatever the fuck you Mm -hmm. want to call race service is investing the time and effort and energy into building apparel and a brand like that. Nobody's doing that. Also, think about this. Think about when you and Yair made your first cinematic cuts, no one was doing that. And you'd be like, why are you taking this much time with this much camera gear? Like no one would know. So I'm like, that's why I always joke in James We Trust. I'm like, do I fully understand why a factory detail and a this and a that and this, but no, or why like, we like would push people have vendors? would yeah would people have fully understood why you were doing the cinematic media you were doing at that time no because no one else was fucking doing it so how could you prove the concept it's showing up showing up early it's it's doing it with the creased shirt it's doing it with intention it's doing it with pride it's the basic if it's worth doing it's worth doing right it's giving a shit yes you know that's it and if you love what you do you give a shit and like be aware of that but yeah. I keep pushing. You're watching this because you created this moment to to hear this message. I promise <laughs> yeah. you. Yeah. I promise you. And and it's like it's yes, dude. Yes. Yeah, that, that's it. And it but it, it's just like all of that comes together. All of Growth. it. Every bit you're saying. And it's like, this is why you are so special to me. It's like you have this insane awareness of the highs, the lows, the ceilings, the lack thereof of ceilings. You can play the game, but you can also think so far outside of it. And it's like, I hope you realize that by you firmly believing that, you empower me to believe that. Mm. You don't have to go as hard as I've gone or you've gone, but just do true, be true to yourself. Now we make things look pretty for motorsport. That's right. And who knows where that goes. All right, let's go to bed. Yeah. (laughs) 